It has been my experience that generally good plant health maintenance, that is, proper selecting and placement of a plant in the landscape, ensuring that it has become established and has sufficient soil, nutrition, and water, is all that is needed by most landscape plants to thrive and produce a desired display. However, our urban landscapes are filled with ill-adapted plants that are given little care other than a hole was dug in the ground, the plant was plunked in the hole, and mulch was placed over it. In this module, I want to bring together some of the ideas that current pest management scientists are discussing in order to reduce our reliance on pesticides as the primary method of dealing with pests in our urban landscapes. The list of things that can be done to help urban landscape plants to thrive and combat pests is pretty long, but professional landscape managers seem to have trouble charging for the expertise needed to utilize these methods and procedures. Simply stated, their customers expect that they are paying for applications of fertilizers, pesticides, and spreading of mulch. To change this expectation, companies that are using more of an IPM approach have to often resort to some scare tactics. This can be a double-edged issue as they are scaring customers out of using those poisons in favor of using organic methods alone. Sooner or later, a pesticide will likely be needed to adequately deal with a pest, and if you have convinced your customer that this shouldn't be done, the ultimate solution will be to remove the pest-infested plant and replace it. In this partial list, I've included the use of pheromone traps, some mechanical techniques, selecting more resistant or tolerant plants, and using good maintenance programs to improve plant health. There's an international movement to go green, especially in urban landscape design. There are all kinds of recommendations to use only native plants in areas where water is a premium. Use xeriscaping, which means to use less water needy plants, and turf grass. Here is a xeriscaped yard in a neighborhood that adopted this as a requirement for its residents. If you know your plant material, only two of the plants in this picture are truly natives to New Mexico. The rest are ornamental arid origin ornamentals. These have nicer colors and forms. Did you notice that all the plants in the yard have a moat around them? Each plant has a trickle tube watering system. Recent audits have shown that these plants will take all the water you can give them, and if the soil sensors are turned off, many of these landscapes are actually using more water than a more traditional landscape. And does that front yard look inviting to you to go out and play? Also, did you notice the privacy fence? What do you think's back behind that fence? Yes, a swimming pool, but also a very lush Kentucky bluegrass lawn. That's where the people want to be. Nobody wants to get out of their pool and walk across rocks and sand. Remember, urban landscapes are for people. On the other extreme is this kind of landscape. This is typical for most of the northeastern United States, but southern and western landscapes can be very similar. This is a young landscape that was established by the neighborhood developer to get folks to buy the house. At this point, everything looks pretty good, doesn't it? But let's take a closer look. This landscape has a purple leaf plum. That tree will soon get peach tree borers and Japanese beetles will skeletonize the foliage every summer. Most likely, this tree came with European fruit lacanium scales, too. There are many cultivars of crab apples that also have purple leaves and don't get borers or foliar fungal diseases. These would be a much better choice. The birch tree is a European white bark birch. Why was that used? It has white bark when small. This tree is highly susceptible to the bronze birch borer and the birch leaf miner. If an American canoe birch was used, that tree is quite resistant to the bronze birch borer, but it can still get leaf miner and aphids. The reason why American birch isn't used is because it doesn't get a white bark until it is about four inches in caliper. So it doesn't look pretty for the first few years in the landscape. Did you spot the three euonymus shrubs? Two variegated ones and a green one. 
if these didn't come with euonymus scale, they soon will get the scale which will require regular treatments. There are many other variegated shrubs that don't get scales or other important pests. Did you notice the larger juniper? This one has already reached the maximum size for this space. While juniper can tolerate regular pruning and shaping, most homeowners don't like to deal with these tasks. There are plenty of other junipers that are dwarf or semi-dwarf in habit and ones that rarely get juniper scale or juniper tip midges. Finally, while this course is only mentioned turf grass, it is definitely part of the landscape. In this yard, Kentucky bluegrass sod was put down. This can easily cover the inverted soil profile that is now the soil for this landscape. Basically, the original topsoil was scraped off this development and sold to someone else. The clay and rubble that was dug out of the basement space was also hauled away, but much of it was spread over the yard. We call this an inverted soil profile, where you have clay and rubble on the surface, not real topsoil. This makes the Kentucky bluegrass sod very susceptible to chinch bug and bill bug attack that can devastate it in the first two to three years. Tall fescue sod would have been a better choice. Tall fescues are resistant to surface insect attack and the plants have deep penetrating root systems. So, why did the developer use these plants? Cost. To put in pest resistant and environmentally tolerant plants often cost twice as much initially. But long term, these plants will need less maintenance, thus saving money in the long run. We have to realize that urban landscapes can be pretty harsh on plants. There are buildings, roads, sidewalks, and things running underground like sewer systems, water pipes, electrical wires, and gas lines. In commercial settings, the building owners are more concerned about getting people and materials in and out of their buildings. But they also know that people are more attracted to buildings that have trees and other greenery. In this case, a bank wanted some trees to shade their customers' cars. So they had the landscaper cut four foot squares in the parking lot and plant trees. I was called out two years later when many of the oak trees were dying from two-line chestnut borer attack. I have no idea why the landscaper planted three trees in each planter other than he knew that he would have to be called back to take care of those poor plants. Many schools also try to landscape so that their facilities look more inviting to the students, parents, and staff. However, one has to pay attention to other details. In this case, several of the teachers were complaining about pavement ants getting into the students' lunch boxes. When I checked, many of the landscape plants had scales or aphids that were supporting the ants. Likewise, each room had a wall-mounted heating and air conditioning unit, which was dumping water into the soil just outside each room. In this case, I recommended an IPM approach that included using silicate sealant around the heating and air conditioning units, running the condensation tubes into a drain to get water away from the foundation, and replacing the aphid and scale prone plants. Actually, I was able to get the plants removed when I pointed out that they were a hazard where kids were throwing their trash and they were conducive to rat populations. I also pointed out some of the shrubs have become so dense that kids could be pulled behind the shrubs by other kids or an adult and not be seen. When these things were done, the ant problem disappeared all without thinking about using pesticides. So, what if you are in an area where Japanese beetle, a common key pest, is active? How can you plan a landscape that will be less attractive to this beetle? In the case of this pest, there are many lists of plants that can be found in the literature and on some websites. However, I would caution you to only use websites that are associated with land-grant universities, as these lists will be based on published information. Here is a table provided by the University of Kentucky Extension Service. It was constructed by Dr. Dan Potter, who is one of the leading entomologists who has done extensive research on Japanese beetle behavior and management. Lots of folks like to use maples and landscape trees, and you can see from this list that sugar and Norway maples would be poor choices. 
However, on the list of plants not attractive to Japanese beetle adults, silver maple and red maples are quite resistant to this pest. While these lists are useful, they only give you a picture concerning one key pest. I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't recommend using native flowering dogwood in our urban landscapes, especially if they are to be sited in open sun, as they will soon get dogwood borers that will take them out. In short, selecting landscape plants because of a single factor will likely result in unsatisfactory results. There seems to be a big effort by well-meaning environmentalists to use more native plants in our urban landscapes. I'm not a big fan of this effort for several reasons. The idea doesn't recognize that planting a native plant in an artificial environment like our urban landscapes doesn't mean it will do any better than a non-native plant. We have seen several times in this course that some native trees, like American canoe birch, are much more resistant to bronze birch borers than the European whitebark birch. However, in the case of flowering dogwoods, the opposite is true. Native flowering dogwood, when put in our urban landscapes, is often stressed and will be readily attacked by the dogwood borer. On the other hand, Coosa dogwood, a non-native, seems to tolerate hot and dry environments and is pretty resistant to the bore. In short, I look at whether a plant is adapted and will thrive in our urban habitats, not whether it's just native or non-native. When we have a plant that has hundreds of named cultivars, things can get even more confusing. If you go back to the list of plants that are susceptible to Japanese beetle attack, crab apples are listed, but notice that there is a footnote. The footnote points out that there are cultivars that are quite resistant to Japanese beetles. We now know of several crab apple cultivars that are resistant to apple scab, which causes early leaf drop, Japanese beetle feeding, and they can still provide different leaf and flower colors. However, one has to look for these data. Just because a tree or shrub regularly gets pests doesn't mean that we need to exclude that tree. Many trees and shrubs can tolerate pretty extensive pest loads without having their long-term health put into jeopardy. I'm a real fan of oaks in the landscape, but one has to remember that oaks don't tolerate transplant very well. So it's better to use a young tree and get it established rather than trying to put in a big tree and stressing it so much that borers take it out. I've seen sycamores hit year after year with leaf anthracnose, lace bugs, and leaf hoppers, but they are almost never taken out. Hackberries often look pretty ragged up close because of all the solid galls, but these trees tolerate these pests with no ill effects. I've already mentioned that oaks are highly intolerant of having their root systems disturbed. However, once established, most oaks can take pretty heavy punishment from foliar diseases and insect attacks. The biggest risk to recently transplanted oaks is the two-line chestnut borer. I regularly recommend tree managers to treat newly transplanted oaks for two years after the transplant to keep the two-line chestnut borer out. After that time, the oak should be able to naturally resist the borer. The locust agrilus is another pest that will also attack recently transplanted honey locust trees. Trees that are treated for the first couple of years after transplant establish and then are resistant to attack by the borer and other pests. Maples are great landscape trees, but there are many cultivars to select from. Most of these are grafted, and the flat-headed apple tree borers like these graft junctions. Attacks are most common soon after transplanting one of these grafted trees. When talking to a potential customer, wise landscape managers should point out any key plants and what key pests are known for the area. There is no reason to be constantly fertilizing and spraying for Scythia. First, Forsythia usually overgrows its space and needs to be pruned back every couple of years. Thus, regular fertilizer will turn this into an annual pruning event. Second, Forsythia has very few insect or mite pests worthy of treatment. On the other hand, hybrid tea roses get several foliar diseases, 
Japanese beetles, leaf hoppers, rose slug sawflies, and rose rosette disease from rust mites. Ardent rosarians will tell you that they have to spray their cherry roses every week or every other week to keep them in peak form. And because of the constant pruning, fertilizer is applied several times per year. In summary, landscape managers should counsel their customers to try to use plants that need fewer maintenance inputs and avoid plants that need extensive management. I have mentioned pheromone traps several times during this course, but only in the context of detecting and monitoring pest activity. I strongly recommend using pheromone traps to determine when some of the clear wing moth borer adults are flying. We also discussed using ethyl alcohol baited traps to detect flight of some of the ambrosia beetles. One of the most infamous insect traps that has been sold for Japanese beetle control is the floral lure trap. This trap was originally developed using eugenol as a floral odor that attracts many male and female Japanese beetles. More recent traps include the sex pheromone that enhances capture of the beetles. The problem with the traps is that they are relatively inefficient. Several studies by Dan Potter and his students in Kentucky have conclusively shown that traps placed within 20 to 50 foot of Japanese beetle attractive plants actually causes more damage to be done to those plants. This can be hard to explain to a happy homeowner that sees thousands of beetles that have been captured by a trap. Unfortunately, for every beetle that went into the trap, another one missed the opening and landed on the nearby plant. Pheromone mating disruption is one of the most efficient methods used to slow the spread of gypsy moth. In this case, small plastic flakes are impregnated with the gypsy moth sex pheromone. These flakes are spread by air over acres of land. This is done a couple of weeks before the first male moths emerge from their pupae. When the males emerge, the air in the area is entirely saturated with the odor of the pheromone, so the males can't locate any real females in the area. This isn't 100% effective as the males will also use visual cues when locating females. So some females will get mated, but most won't. While this method works on a township-wide or county-wide management of this pest, it isn't recommended for individual landscapes as the small area covered can't permeate the air sufficiently to stop males from locating females. Many pests in the landscape are easily controlled by simply pulling them off the plants and crushing or disposing of them. About half of the bags of bagworms will contain egg masses. If these are snipped off of an infested tree and crushed, put into a garbage bag, or dropped into a pan of detergent water, a small population can be stopped. Obviously, if you're dealing with plants with hundreds of bags on them, you're probably better off spraying when the larvae emerge. Notice that the fall webworm nest in this image is on a single branch. A pole pruner will quickly get this eyesore out of the tree. Again, disposed by crushing or drenching the caterpillars with a detergent solution. Syringing is nothing more than using a jet of water to knock off insects. This has been a time-honored technique in greenhouses to knock down aphids and even whiteflies. A morning and evening syringing will also eliminate all active stages. This method is also good for controlling of aphids in the landscape. The fat bodied and spindly legs of aphids make it difficult for them to crawl back to their host plants. In many cases, syringing can slow down aphid development until natural predators and parasitoids arrive. We don't have space in this course to go into all the details of proper planting of trees, shrubs, and flowers in our urban landscapes. Trees and shrubs especially are often planted too low in the soil and their crowns are covered with the soil. Ball and burlap plants are often planted without removing the burlap or even wire baskets. This will eventually girdle the plant and kill it. Plants in pots often develop roots that run around the edge of the pot. When these are planted without snipping these roots, the roots eventually can girdle the trunk of a tree or shrub. The time that a plant is installed is also important. 
Not all plants do well with fall planting, and other plants are best planted in the fall. Unfortunately, many landscape plants get installed in mid-June through July when they go on sale. These stressed plants have been in the nursery lot for months, and the hot weather isn't kind to them. Most established plants don't need regular fertilizer applications. I generally recommend judicious fertilization only for newly planted plants, and even then, not at planting, but after the plant is showing signs that it has developed a good root system. Regular fertilization is also beneficial to young landscapes where the owner may want the small plants to reach a more mature look quickly. Only a few plants readily benefit from regular fertilizations. Heavy blooming plants like roses will produce more blooms with regular fertilization. Fertilizers thrown onto mulch does us nothing but help promote fungal growth in the mulch. Granular fertilizer should be applied to the soil or soil injections can be used. However, use caution with soil injections as some injectors can actually inject fertilizer below the root zone where it is of little use to the plant. I often joke that the average homeowner has only two ways to water plants, too much and not at all. Most people have no idea how much water is needed to adequately wet soil to a depth of two to three inches. We're also seeing a lot of problems with layered mulch in plant beds. If this mulch is allowed to completely dry, it will become hydrophobic and surface applied irrigation will simply run off to the side and the tree and shrub roots will get no water. In recent years, several companies have developed trickle irrigation bag systems. After transplanting a tree or shrub, fill one of these bags with water and the bag will slowly trickle out the water. These can be really helpful in establishing new plantings. Other folks put in irrigation systems, but regular maintenance is needed for these to work correctly. When correctly done, mulching can be highly beneficial in landscapes. Mulch only needs to be about two to three inches in depth to provide these benefits. Mulch helps maintain soil moisture and temperature and prevent weed seed germination. However, too much mulch can keep the soil too wet or develop hydrophobic zones where no water can penetrate. Mulch can also support microbes that remove nitrogen and other nutrients that are needed by the plants. Decaying mulch can provide food for millipedes, sow bugs, and other detritivores and the detritivore predators. These can become real nuisance pests in and around homes and buildings. Deep mulch around trees and shrubs can also cause bark rotting and contribute to root diseases. This is often called volcano mulch trees. When thick mulch layers are found, it should be removed or thinned out. 